All right, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to, um, usually that's the best part of the talk, the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> now it's going downward. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> substellar objects. I'm going to talk about the young aspect, old aspect, metal rich and metal poor. So pretty much uh, uh, everything about substellar objects. Uh, Dwindle, dwindle is just a joke. Uh, it is faint, small in size. It includes uh, brown dwarfs and also planet mass objects. Actually, it, it also it's because of this, you know, we all know the definition of planets. It's wandering stars orbiting around stars, right? Um, but now they are free floating objects, that of planetary mass. So there's no way to call it that, so it's called planet mass object, quite popular for now. So I'm going to describe you, in order to show the muscle, I'm going to just show you the skeleton of what uh, McGrew and I, and also the collaborator, have been doing to find these young brown dwarfs, and some old brown dwarfs, and also a different uh, population. And eventually we hope to build up enough sample to, to compare them with stellar counterparts. So the outline is very short introduction, astronomy 101, about substellar objects. How to search for the young population, to describe our effort to study the dynamical evolution of these objects in star clusters. Because star cluster we have age, so we can know their uh, uh, evolution, a dynamic evolution. I hope I have time to show a couple of slides about the magnetism in these objects, all right? Um, and then the last few slides describe about, again, our effort to, in addition to these rich uh, pop one objects, what about the metal pool uh, population? So to start off, I'm going to describe many work from two consortium. One is called the W band. This W means water. We use this specialized filter to identify water-bearing objects, namely ground dwarfs and planet, planet mass objects. The, the, the project was uh, it has been led by a Beth Filler, an uh, astronomer in UK, Canada, and also. Uh, uh, from uh, other countries. And at NCU, uh, John Bosu was my postdoc. He has already left astronomy. My current PhD, oops, sorry, my current PhD student, Afna Larger, Tommy Sharma, now uh, working on this project. <coughs> Su Yun Tang was my uh, master's student, now he's in northern uh, Arizona. Another project is JCMT, that's the sub millimeter <coughs> project. It's in the transient project to monitor possible transient events. But we use this uh, data as well. In, a, in addition to transient events, we also make use to trace molecular clouds and, and clumps and their relationship with young stars and young brown dwarfs. Mm -hmm. And this project uh, involves a lot of people. I, I list uh, uh, Doug Johnston, Greg Isaac, also in uh, the W band, and also these people. Ashish Gupta is our, uh, my new master students. All right, so this is a, quite a, a huge group. Either project pro provides quite unique data sets, and we are in an advantage point that we have both data sets to do the uh, cross correlation study, to co co cross correlate the two. This, this is the essence of the definition of stars, brown dwarfs, and planets. Stars, as we learn, they have masses above, above 7 or 8% of the sun, so that the, the central, te central temperature is high enough in density to, uh, to ignite and sustain core hydrogen fusion. We learn in Astronomy 101, they have the spectrotypes OBFGKN. Beyond about mid M, they are too cold that these objects have masses between 
6.5% of the sun, but because the sun has about 1,000 times mass of Jupiter, so we call it about 65 Jupiter masses. So between 65 Jupiter masses and 13 <coughs> Jupiter masses, they never ignite hydrogen, but their central temperature is high enough to ignite deuterium. Being the isotope, the ignition temperature is lower, so they will start, but deuterium is in short supply, so this, this nuclear reaction only takes place for a short time. Above 65 Jupiter masses and below 80, and that these stars can even ignite lithium. So these are called brown dwarfs, they have spectral type from mid N to L to T and even to Y. By the way, astronomer ran out of alphabet. So if we find anything cooler, it will be just Y. Right? It's already in the hundreds of, 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 of K. They, their center are degenerate, right? They have, have to be cooler and up to about Y. Below 13 Jupiter masses, they, are, they, they undergo no fusion whatsoever in their life. So that's the definition of stars, brown dwarfs, and planets. Sure enough, but these objects are defined by their mass. And the mass is not readily measurable. So we astronomers have temperature, luminosity. When we learn about stars, that's OK. The star, this is time. This is uh, 1 million. This is 1, one giga year. So a star would fall. Um, uh, it become fainter. This is luminosity, uh, descent along the Hayashi track, so it bec becomes fainter until it becomes stable for <laughs> billions of years. That's fine. Planet, however, because there's no sustainable nuclear uh, energy source, they become fainter and thereby actually cooler after birth. From <laughs> Is in between. They, they, they are in between. They, they, they have this still this uh, temporary uh, nuclear reaction to maintain the, the brightness. So they, they probably are formed like stars. They have some fusion, but then they evolve like planets. Right. Right now, the, the current paradigm is that stars are formed in molecular cloud cores, one or two single, single or binary stars. And planets are formed or condensed in the circumstellar disks around stars. What is the formation mechanism about brown holes? Right now, it's still uncertain. Whether they also come out from the fragmentation of cloud core and they form a sub uh, with substellar mass, or if they form in a disk and then somehow get kicked out from the, from the disk. Right, so right now, it's still not clear, and that's because we still need a good, well-studied sample of brown dwarfs. This is in contrast, either it's brown dwarfs or free floating planets in, are in contrast from exoplanets. Exoplanets are orbiting around some parental stars, so they are different. All right, so either the luminosity behave like this, and so is the temperature, right? So, so here I just generate this, just have the anchor point, so spectral type from O <coughs> to Y. So you, you see that this is already a few hundred K. And so to give some, some idea, so below mid N, so we're in, entering the uh, brown dwarf regime, and L0 has a temperature about 2000 K, and 10 to the minus 4 solar <coughs> luminosity. But when we move to T0, then the temperature is 1,000 K cooler, and the luminosity is an order fainter. Right? These are really cold, really faint. They have atmosphere between 2,000 to about several hundred K. That's the temperature of Jupiter, Saturn. And they cool quickly. So they change their spectral type with time. Whatever we have, we measure, the temperature of luminosity cannot be converted to mass anymore. We don't know 
whether they are brown dwarf or planet or star, right? It's, it's just it's time dependent, defining our knowledge of our stars. And <clears throat> the, the cool facts of the less mess. Their SED, given the temperature, peaks around near infrared, for which there's a lot of atomic and molecular <clears throat> line of bands. And it is interestingly enough, again, unlike stars, they could have, because given this low temperature, they could rain. <laughs> they have dust condensation in their clouds. So there could be they have cloudy <clears throat> atmosphere. Interesting. A lot of chemistry. <clears throat> But so far, the majority of these substellar objects are found only in the solar neighborhood because they are faint, right? Uh, but in the solar neighborhood means they are in the field, they have already aged. So our first task is to identify these <coughs> very young brown dwarf or high mass objects in formation or near evolution. So the trick is to find them in nearby star forming regions. But the nearest star forming region would be already 200 parsecs away, while most of these field brown dwarfs are within 10, 20 parsecs, all right? So we need a young sample, but it's a, a rather very challenging. And fortunately, these objects are brighter when they're younger, so it's still possibility to identify them, but the problem is the confusion. <clears throat> when you are seeing a star forming region, it could be background objects that get uh, reddened. So our strategy is to use what we have in Taiwan at NCU, our access to wide field infrared imaging, using, using, sorry, using specialized filter to detect methane or water use the on-off imaging technique to diagnose cool atmosphere. So by doing this, we narrow down the list of candidates from hundreds to dozens. And then we use large telescope, whatever we have access to, Gemini, VRT, Subaru, and Polymer this five meter, but we have used them all. As long as we get time, we get infrared confirmation spectrum. So this turned out to be a very effect, effective way. So the first part is to hunt for young substellar objects. All right, this shows the typical spectrum. This is a, uh, a mid M, all right? So we see the typical M dwarf feature, titanium oxide. <coughs> But we start to see some possibly some some uh, some uh, uh, band heads. Mm -hmm. This is an L5. They will move to T8. This is very cold atmosphere, featuring methane, uh, ammonia, and also water absorption. Mm -hmm. In comparison, this is the spectrum of Jupiter. It looks similar to our T8. The, 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 the takeaway message is that in this wavelength range, the objects no longer radiate like black body. If you are <coughs> familiar with the broadband photometry, so this is the slope between one micron J band and H band and K band is toward the blue. So it, the, the, the color is bluer for very low temperatures because of these substantial absorption band, right? So molecular absorption dominates the spectrum. And the, 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 the T dwarfs is so named just because of this methane dwarfs, right? So the key here would be the methane absorption, methane, a lot of methane, and also, also water absorption. So this is a busy uh, slide <clears throat> showing a typical, I think this is a T4, yes, this is a T4, a T4 spectrum across um, between 1.5 uh, in, in near infrared. Overplotted are the filter transmission curves at major telescopes. It's really busy, so there's a 
CFHT method on and off. So, um, but in other, uh, this is specifically to detect methane uh, bands. But in other um, uh, telescopes, there, there's probably not such specialized filter. So sometimes we have to use some iron band, uh, iron line filter, and uh, also some uh, archive data like Y's, like uh, Spitzer. So they, all this transmission curve was somehow devised so that we could possibly detect the suppression, flux suppression in the relevant uh, regime. So we started this program uh, four, five, maybe six years ago to use the CMHT methane filter either to use the on with off or to compare it with the broadband edge. All right? mm -hmm. This is a, a te te typical technique people use to detect H alpha emission line stars. Using imaging rather than spectroscopy is more efficient. Mm -hmm. So we first test. The reason I show this is just to show you how we did it. We measure this flux difference, some index, with respect to objects showing no known objects. They are not from groups with known L, or these black dots, and T groups. Sure enough, the known L cannot be distinguished from regular N, because L objects do not show method. It is the T that show method, and sure enough, all these non-objects using the this index, we could identify the temple. Right. So once we are certain, we can calibrate our data. I will not explain these figures; they are very complicated. The idea is when people publish round of candidates in the star forming region, I'm not kidding. It sometimes come up with hundreds if not thousands of candidates, just because the broadband colors fit the criteria. So they, they publish a lot, they, they do statistics. So in in our first attempt, in row of Yocas, the most uh, active star forming cloud, air 1688, we narrow it down to 28 uh, deep dwarf candidates, all right? There are a, a lot of N, a lot of conditions to we know through the, uh, the uh, against contaminants. But this is already much better than the literature, and then we cross-check, either use some methane index, as I described before, the around 1.6 uh, micron, and, and some uh, uh, IRAC color, and also to also, some cool temperatures, still, still broadband photometry, and we use the end condition to cross the, the two. And once we identify the candidate, they are marked in red, we put them into the color magnitude diagram. They are not pre selected by color or brightness. But sure enough, once we do that, they fall or they are consistent with about 1 million year old. With the, the, the isochrome. So, 28 is still a lot because every object would be faint, so it, it takes hours in a, on an 8 meter telescope, right? So, so, we could only select a few, the most prominent candidates, and that's good. We identify a few, confirm a few T dwarfs, and one. Air dwarfs. So compare, comparison with uh, models allow the, us to estimate their possible temperature. Because they are in about to about 1100. We confirm the youngest spectroscopically confirmed T dwarfs in row of. All right. L later on, led by a uh, Beth Miller. They designed this W filter instead of methane. This filter, the, the transmission curve, is sensitive to this 1.4 micron suppression. If you see different spectra type relative to, to some local continuum, you see this continuous flux drop. 
The advantage of the water feature is that it's, it works more than just the T tools. It also works in L. The disadvantage is this. We have a lot of water in our atmosphere. Right. So you have to go high, go where it's staying. So it's challenging. So the, again, the same trick we used with the device uh, uh, index called Q. It's a combination of the J band flux, H band flux. The combination of the two allow us to estimate the reddening. But also the local suppression between J band and W band and H band and W band give, again, the uh, the suppression. So this Q index is similar to uh, early, early year people use P and Q in indices for the reddening free uh, 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 color magnitude uh, algorithm to show that. So this Q somehow give us a, whether the object has this water band feature taken into account of the reddening. reddening. And indeed, for non object, it seems to work. So our attempt for this is in, in Taurus. We use uh, actually quite a lot of uh, CFH time, CFHT time. Thank you to many members here of the tech. Uh, so in this, again, the most active star from the cloud, L1495, we find 14 candidates. One of them is already known. So again, they are not pre-selected by uh, uh, um, brightness or, or color, but once we plot them, uh, they, they are consistent with the isochrome. So we use spectroscopic time whenever we have, and we indeed confirm a few. Only a few, right? because that's already pretty good. This, for example, the, the original spectrum is very uh, noisy, but we don't care about the detail. We can repeat the data because we care about the general slope uh, in, in the near infrared regime. <coughs> For this particular one, we think we, we could confirm it out with model as an L4. Very cold temperature with low gravity. That means they're young, they're still contracting there. Compared with model, it's a planetary mass object about a few Jupiter masses in Taurus, 130 parsecs. All right, our latest work published by uh, Jesse Jones, she, she again using this Q index to identify candidates, taking a, a spectroscopy with, uh, I think it's Gemini, uh, then, uh, then uh, just compare with model, the same trick and come up with, for example, one particular uh, object show the partial beta and a bracket gamma in emission, signifying uh, accretion activity and with spectra type and some estimate about luminosity, we could put them in the HR diagram so to infer the possible mass. Right? So these are confirmed Brongov or planetary mass objects in Serpent's South. So, thank you. So, 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 those are still embedded in a regular cloud. Um, depends on how you are. Uh, this one is embedded, right? This one is AB above 4. It's not heavily embedded. Right, right. I don't understand. Because you can see nothing. Right. You can see them so you need for to take the spectrum. Yes, that's true. My question was, do you, can you also identify the, any uh, like a dust or like a cloud associated with those candidates? Uh, Ten slides later. OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are identifying the candidate, what is the major conclusion source? Uh, they mostly, but so if you only look at the isochrome, so all the other conclusion source are they mostly background giant and high peak galaxies? Yeah, both. So in, in our spectroscopic uh, observation, I probably put it somewhere. We observe six. One is an emission line uh, galaxy, right? It just pop up in the future. And one background star, two cool stars, but they have no method. They're just, they're just cold. Mm -hmm. so the confusion rate is still high, even though we already 
use a quite con contingent criteria. Our idea is that by using very contingent sets of criteria, we may not be complete. So the sample will be reliable. That's what we want. All right? So the next topic is about their dynamical evolution in star clusters. This is a, a very short. Originally, I prepared about three or four slides about this. But since Yohua asked me to give a talk in ASROC, I probably will talk about star clusters. I will go through this very quickly. Um, so you know, stars are formed in groups, right? So they form as a cluster and they disperse, and they become the field of stars. So this evolves with stellar evolution, evolves with time. So initially, <coughs> in molecular clouds, we know they are clumpy, they are filamentary, and so the newly formed star cluster must form that way, patchy, right, clumpy. The internal dynamical evolution, the mutual, exchanges of momentum would allow the more massive star to lose speed and they sink to the center. This is called the mass segregation. At the same time, low mass stars, they gain velocity, they will occupy an ever larger volume, and it, some of them, particularly the least massive members, Brondo, low mass members, they will have they will gain velocity to exceed the escape velocity, they will be evaporated, escape from the star clusters, right? And so and this internal virilization would cause the star cluster to become a round shape, like we see in globular cluster as isolated system, but they start to lose. Low mass members, they become loosened and loosened. Eventually, the cluster will be evolved, will be evapor uh, will be uh, disintegrated. At the same time, within the galactic disk, there are more than internal perturbation, there are external perturbation. There's, there's tidal forces, there could be disk shocking, there could be uh, the, the galactic differential rotation. They all act to tear the cluster apart. All right, and then eventually the, the, the distance. I have this time, different times here, I wanna talk about that. For everyone studying a global property of star cluster, they are bound to produce the initial mass function. They may not be correct, because it's not initial, but they, they may not be, they, all we observe will be the luminosity or magnitude distribution. You have to convert that to mass, in order to get the initial mass function, right? But for stars, it would be still possible for brown dwarfs, haha, it's time dependent, model dependent, and even the model, depending on whether the cloud will be dusty or not, the mass will be different, right? So it's a lot of uncertainty here. But anyway, people try. So this is the, the different star clusters. Uh, open cluster, global cluster versus uh, association, we see a common trend that the initial mass function seems to be universal among clusters, even maybe among galaxies, so far as we know, even though we're not quite sure, quite, no, we don't, know, we don't quite know the origin. But it's, they, they seem to all peak around 0.2, 0 0.3 solar masses. This may or may not have anything to do with the genes mass, right? I don't know, but the, the, when one move, the high mass part is certain, but when moves around this peak, some of them they get flattened or even flare up, some come down. It is the low mass part, below 0.2 solar masses, not brown dwarf yet, brown dwarf will be here, right? But the low mass part, anything beyond this peak, seems there seems some funny thing. Skip that. This is a figure uh, I took from a proposal I'm reviewing. I'm sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> this is a protostar plan. But it's so nice, and there's no secret. We, everyone can, can do this. But I think this is a nicely uh, presented, and we, we, we should all learn. 
So this is the initial mass function. There's a peak coming down, and there's coming down. So this is the mass limit, 8% of the sun, and this is the maximum, maybe 150 solar masses for, for stars for a brown door. Right? And so one can parameterize the peak and also the slope. That's why in different star forming region, they try to do that, they try to parameterize this function, right? This is a nearby star forming region, IC348. This is Taurus before Gaia. They seem to be by model. People claim this. In addition to a one to two million year old population, there may be a 10 million year old population. Why not? Stars may not form simultaneously, right? They, they could have triggered star formation or just different uh, compensation schemes. But after Gaia, that gap seems to uh, go away. Still, right, this is interesting. This is the different uh, the, the mass function. This is spectral type, but seems to uh, uh, agree with uh, IC3. Interesting. One thing. Yeah. Um, what makes the change before and after Gaia? Is that? Distance. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. And also their proper motion. They, they will allow you to filter out contam con contamination. The people also find not only in the central part of Taurus, there may be uh, some other smaller clouds. Yes. All right, so this is our work. We, <clears throat> we uh, took the strategy that we either do statistical study of hundreds of clusters, do statistics, or we do detailed study of individual clusters. So we have a very, very good handle. We pro provide, so far, the most reliable member list of these clusters. The first one we work on is called Presapi M44. It's nearby, was intermediate age. All right, we use proper motions, we use you know, photometry or, or classical methods. But at that time, there's no Gaia yet. We use PPMXL, some proper motion uh, a catalog to constrain the membership. Then we compare with isochrome to identify. So this is the initial mass function, the mass function, I'm sorry, not initial. This is the mass function that we derive. All right, once we have this list, then we do uh, so-called dynamical analysis. We bin our sample for stars greater than 0.7 solar mass. This is still a low mass, but it's already the largest uh, mass in our sample. We, we don't care about the high, high mass members. The least massive is almost it's almost 0.2 solar masses. Not brown dwarf yet. It's almost there, right? But so we. Normalized, we calculate the surface number density, normalize to the center, and to see how the profile will go. Mass segregation. The most massive sample sink to the center, progressively larger volume, progressively larger volume, but until the least, the last bin, the least massive sample shows a funny shape, and that is stellar evaporation. So these stars are being evaporated. They already they only occupy about this part, and they are already being depleted at the outer skirt. So the mass function still normally peaked at 0.3, but the least mass, I'm sorry, least the massive members are being evaporated. Right. Evaporation should be continuous. I'm sorry? Evaporation should be continuous in terms of the mass. Effect should be continuous. What is should be continuous? Effect of evaporation should be continuous in terms of the cell mass. I don't understand why only the low mass. So it should yeah, be continuous. The, the lowest mass will the, the gain the gain velocity. And yeah. also they suffer the external perturbation. They are most vulnerable to Ripped off. Ah, but uh, why don't we see this effect for the for example, blue line? Not yet. This is not yet. Landscape. Landscape. not old enough. We will see. Okay, okay. Landscape. So this is the, that question about the uh, clumps and 
stars, all right? So we, we are part of this JCMT transient survey. The purpose is to detect transient, all right? It is the first systematic survey of such events in submillimeter wavelengths. But in addition to the transient data, we also use that to, to, to trace vapor clouds. So this transient survey in the last three, four years monitor eight gold belt regions, they're marked here, on a monthly cadence. The number here shows the number of epochs we have, all right? So this, this uh, IC348 has been observed 34 times, all right? That's good. Use this SCUBA 2, right? SCUBA 2, of course, offers A50 micron and 450 micron emission simultaneously, and we reach, once we co-add all the data, we reach a single epoch about 12, 10 millijens per p. And that's already twice as sensitive as the original gold belt survey. So right now, even the steady state, the stationary data, we have very good data set to study these warm To show you some example, this is IC348, so we have this submillimeter emission, this must be A50, and then use some algorithm to detect clumps, to break them, and then to see how this redness varies, if any, uh, with time. This is a seven cell, the paper I just showed. All right, so this has been published last year, Oh, uh, yes, last year. We detected a first flare event. It's really strong. It's nearly 500 Medianski and just of a single aircon, right? So here, boom, down. And so this is one flare event. This is, however, a, a T Tauri star. It's not a proto star that we aim for. So this is likely not due to uh, in homogeneous accretion, we interpret this because we also have 450 micron flux, so we allow us to estimate the spectral index, and we believe it's non thermal. So it's probably a magnetic reconnection event, just pretty much like our sun, there's a flare, right? But this is a really big flare for such a tiny star. This is unpublished, it's in preparation. Uh, by uh, Bafna Lauchen, she detected the second source. It's not as uh, uh, as bright, but it's still a five sigma event. Uh, so this is, uh, but this is this object is Hubs 88. It's a known high velocity outflow source. So probably young, right? So this is a young object embedded, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, again, using the JCMG co-edited data, we study, for example, IC348. This is a cluster, all right? The index uh, cluster. But the active formation, sub-formation activity actually is in the uh, uh, southwest. We see a lot of uh, cloud material. So we cross correlate the clumps with known young stars, uh, making the distinction of class 0 or 1 of flat sources or Titori stars or more evolved population. But to me, I'm also interested in X ray photo stars. I pay particular interest to those. Photo star that emit X ray or Brundle that emit X ray. Because the idea is our knowledge about the uh, uh, stellar magnetism is some kind of a dynamo mechanism that requires uh, convection, requires differential rotation, right? But it requires some charges. For regular star, it's okay. Uh, interior temperature will be high, so materials are ionized. 
But I figure because m dwarfs, when we move down to late and later m, the star become more and more chromospherically active. They have more show X-rays, emission line. They also uh, show flares. All right. Then I, I thought, when we move even to brown dwarfs, what happened? They should be even more chromospherically active because they're com completely convective. They also rotate fast. But eventually, that mechanism should stop because when, when the after become too cold, the interior will be pretty much neutral. There's no current, no magnetic field, right? No dynamo. I thought, hey, let's do that. Let's see where the X-ray emission or um, uh, would stop. At what spectrotype temperature would the dynamo mechanism <coughs> ceases, ceases to work? I thought it was nice. Until one day I thought, wait a minute, Jupiter has magnetic field, <laughs> right? Nature find a way. Doesn't have to be dynamo. Even, you know, uh, 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 I don't remember which are Uranus or Neptune. They're, they're even colder. They also have weak magnetic field due to some charged material. It doesn't have to be hydrogen. So it's funny. So I don't have any idea. So I would say let the data speak. So we're still currently working on this to cross correlate X ray sources from. This is another piece of work by uh, Ashish Gupta. He actually will be a summer student here. Usually, I don't give away good master students. But he's so good. I say, I cannot handle him anymore. So I have to pass him to here. So please, treat him well. He's very, very smart and worked very hard. So this is his work in six months in, 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 in master program. So again, in row off, we see these famous filaments, right? From the morphology, you already can guess. Something probably happened here that it no, just erodes all the clouds. So it becomes this kind of a filamentary shape. So all the known YSOs, they also have some line, lining up. But they no clouds. So previously, they probably have a cloud. So it must trace the star forming history. I'm not talking about that. So we cross correlate again known YSO list with the state of the art molecular gas data, and we come up with this. More than just the position with Gaia, which can trace only the bright, brighter sources, so sources without much extinction to this part, or we rely on some infrared data, archive data, to derive proper motion uh, by ourselves. Right, so we, do. so we also know their kinematics. So we can boil down to how fast the object moves on the plane of the sky, the tangential velocity between the least evolved, more evolved. I don't actually understand this. Uh, maybe it's because more in uh, class zero and one, their positions are very uncertain, and so are their proper motions. So there's a larger dispersion. All right? So I cannot interpret this yet. But once we put some visible stars and compare with some isochrome, we just divide the sample into those that are more massive than one solar masses, and less than one solar mass, we seem to have this kind of distribution. And that's funny. To me, this sulfur region is too young to undergo any dynamical evolution. There's no time for relaxation. So this must reflect the star formation condition at the beginning, right? How relatively high mass star, this is only one solar mass, and, and low mass star, how they uh, behave separately, right? The higher mass seems to have more or move slower than uh, uh, relatively lower mass star. Then we zoom into this region. This is the cloud air 68. This is the, the, the densest part for which even, I think people argue, even 13 CO 
may not be up to the thing, all right? So people have to rely on 18 CO to estimate the, the gas mass. So our A50 micron will not work if uh, uh, for, for, for uh, dust mass estimate. But we do have motion of stars. So our uh, conclusion, is, again, uh, temporary, is that it's certainly sub -variable. So the cloud is, uh, the, the cluster is relatively stable. One last slide I show you about this work is we do have this projected distance from the nearest clump. This is bias because clump are continuous, right? So it's really hard to define the boundary, da da da, but still, it's quite striking to me that class three, of course, they're always away from cloud, right? That's um, not, not closely associated with um, clumps of gas as much as uh, class one object. So this, this histogram, I think, shows clearly a rendition of the morphological uh, statistics of object versus clouds. Well, again, Having both data sets, our next job is to see how Brandorf factor in into this picture. If Brandorfs are dynamically kicked out, they should have systematically larger velocity dispersion than any young stars. So that's our next test. But they are faint, right? So even archive infrared data would be you know, very difficult to derive any motion. But we're doing that. All right. All right. I would use. I will switch gear. I will have about another ten minutes or so. Almost running out. Of yeah. Another ten minutes. Or right. I will speed up. This is uh, the distribution of open clusters. So they're all in the planet and globular cluster above and below. Right. So this is astronomy one one. The fact that a cluster is high in latitude may not mean it's high above the planet. It's just because they're nearby, right? It's a projection effect. But we started out with two interesting uh, outliers. One is near the North Galactic Pole. It's called Coma Perianasis. The other is Blanco 1. So this has a latitude, galactic latitude A4. This is above A. So they are really high above the planet. So our view will not be confused by the motion in the disk. We directly see the x, y, the, uh, the motion. So that's our first two projects. One is Blanco 1, 100 million years, relatively young, all right? I will skip the detail. Again, we are very, very careful. I, we, I still think we provide the most reliable memory list. So that allows us to detect for the first time the tidal structure of this cluster. This is the tidal tail of this cluster. And if we divide by position one tail and another tail, and we diagnose them in proper motion, sure enough, they also move differently. So these are truly uh, disintegrating members from this star cluster. And again, we measure their spatial distribution we convince ourselves that the most massive members, two solar masses or so, they are slightly segregated, right? But the most massive members, about two solar masses, they start to segregate. 100 million year old cluster, we start to see most massive members start to concentrate over the center. The second star cluster is Coma Baryanasis. Many of you, including me, people working on this But it is the second nearest cluster other than Hyades. It's so close, it's 85 parsecs, but we never heard of it. Why? Too big and too sparse, right? They are not obvious. But anyway, again, membership identification. And sure enough, we identify some because it's so close. So we identify some brown loops. I think we, we found two, L4 and L4. L2 and L4, that's good. And again, we also find tidal tail. Don't care about this, we also find tidal tail. 
But in this particular cluster, this is already 800 million years old. They're all above the galactic plane, relatively. And we found that members in the tidal tails outnumbered those in the core. So there are only 77 in the core, but there are 200, uh, 100 or so in the tail. This star cluster has already in the advanced stage of disintegration, right? So I think vividly we see the disintegration, right? This paper will be submitted actually today, uh, maybe tomorrow. This is just to make use of the LAMO um, uh, spect spectra databases, and we visually, not we, a young girl, visually inspect 9,000 spectrum and select out giants. Select out only spectra type later than M6. So this is a spectroscopically confirmed brown dwarf sample, right? That's, that's nice. So we have that diagnostic, and we found 300 brown dwarfs in the field. There are also 62 of them in Taurus Southern region, right? So they are brown dwarfs. In one or two million years old, M6 is already kind of nice out. Even though they're hot, they're young, right? so they're of low, low mass. We also find 27 pairs. I'm particularly excited about this. So at the center, we have Lamo spectrum, every one of them. But we find co-moving objects. They would, this would be potentially useful if we follow the orbit. We can get the mass, right? So this is, I, I'm personally also interested about the mass ratio, the brightness ratio. The, the question is whether a brown dwarf will preferentially form with another brown dwarf, or it could be next to a B star, A star. That would be a very interesting question, right? Mm -hmm. So this will be submitted uh, hopefully tomorrow. All right, the last part, uh, the timing is about right, is the metal pool. It's when we make use of the hyper supreme camp data, it's meant for extra galaxies, for cosmology. But the data are there, so we use the, the wide uh, uh, program, so it has a large sky footprint, and reasonably deep, but we use the multicolor photometry, UGRIZY, uh, to find candidate uh, brown holes. All right? uh, again, I will not go into the detail. This is photometry based, so it's more complicated, even though nowadays we, we have Lamo for, uh, I'm sorry, for Gaia for brighter sources. But anyway, they still could, would have a relatively low false positive rate. We still find 180 front of candidates, not too many. And including 12, they show metal pool uh, feature, right? So these, I don't know actually how to call them. Uh, we already have brown dwarf, right? These are sub dwarf. Sub dwarf means pop two, right? So they should be brown sub dwarf or sub brown dwarf. I don't know. There's no name at the moment. They are metal pool, Kennedy metal pool. We cannot see very far. So even above and below the galactic plane, we cannot see very deep into the halo or anything. But they could be in the so called thick disk. That would be potentially interesting, right? So the spectra are even just a mess, right? And so I will not go through them, but for example, for this particular one, you now it's cold, it's uh, evolved, it's large with G, but it's made of polar, according to the theory, right? All right, so, so let me conclude. So we have developed I think, quite reliable pipeline to identify substellar candidates from the youngest ones still in associated with medical cloud and to aging generation in the disk and probably to the metal pool population into the uh, high uh, uh, away from the disk. 
The strategy now is to use four meter class wide field imaging, do it wisely, and use eight to 10 meter class telescope for spectroscopic firearm. Row off Torres fine, 130. Even IC340A out to 300 parsecs would be a far cry. This is already too difficult with this approach. Our next goal is now use the next generation 8 to 10 meter wide field imaging, do the same trick using specialized filter, and then use the 20, 30, 40 meter telescope for confirmation. And by that time, we should have enough sample to do characterization of this sub object. They are cold. Uh, before I work on this, I didn't realize it's such a, uh, I think many people here work on molecular clouds, they're even colder. But they're just two separate things. Right? You work on clouds, you don't care about stars. <laughs> Some people work on stars, they don't care about clouds, right? Somewhere they have to, Mother Nature would have to merge them together. So they have clouds, they have different isotopes, the, the, the molecules I've never uh, uh, seen before. So eventually, I hope we will build up the statistics of these young brown dwarf relative to young stars in terms of binary frequency, disk frequency, or even the mass uh, function. Who knows? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Catching the lava. I'm sorry. <laughs> of planet. <laughs> How about I? Uh, so, for your frontal samples, do you know the binary ratio? Like, is the Gaia frontal motion good enough to constrain? The, the frontal pair I show would detect a couple of dozen. Uh, they are true binary. They co moving in this space. All right? They have the same distance, mm. same space motion. They are true pairs. Mm -hmm. right? Um, but LAMO provides only spectrum for one component. Mm -hmm. For the other component, we have to use some SED mm -hmm. testing. So, mm -hmm. so the, the answer is no. We don't know the mass ratio. That's what I said. For that fraction, so how, how much of the sample is? Well, we only have a dozen pair, right? Mm -hmm. We could have the flux ratio, mm -hmm. but that cannot be converted to mass ratio because we don't know the age. So that's that's the current problem. So given, I don't know, another five, six years, we may be able to see the orbital motion. Then we can constrain their total mass and their, thereby probably the mass ratio, maybe. Can you measure the radio velocity from the most data? The most data, I think these are the very Because line, lines are so broad, maybe we cannot measure radio velocity. I don't know. Uh, we did check the radio velocity, but it's just extremely difficult. I think these are faint. The, the image I show you are hand star images. They have reasonable point spread function, but they can reach 20, 21st, 22nd sometimes, but not Lamo, Lamo 15, 16. So it, it requires some special uh, spectroscopic run. Yes, RV will be. Uh, uh, you have uh, you have now opening of the mouth, I see. I saw the yeah. In the <laughs> no. The the spectra are really ugly. <laughs> right? We sometimes have a, a hint which is ha this is I don't need, you know how you how to call it, F E H. Hydratic iron or something, I don't know. But no, the answer is no. No metallicity measure or no abundance measure. Well, the thing is, if you have a full reference spectrometer, I don't know, we will do a lot because between L2, L2, L2 is a very, very busy temperature. It was well done already. And uh, aluminum. We need a lot of glass. Aluminum and <laughs> Fourier uh, transform spectrometer require a lot of photons, right? High, high, high uh, 
Yes, the ROT in the field, yeah. if they are 10 parsecs, 5 parsecs away, they are, they, they can be bright. But if you, uh, if you go to the South Indian region, it's, it's hopeless. But even for the field, it would be interesting, I agree. Yeah. So it, that's why, at the moment, if you find one and you observe with high uh, spectral dispersion, you do the modeling, and usually the result is that the theory and observation do not agree with each other. Yeah. That's just the so point. I need that though. Yeah? Yeah. No, no, it's a very... Oh, a lot of variables, yes. Uh, isotope. Isotope. Mm -hmm. yes. You are so interested in isotope. I'm, I'm, I'm already very busy with main element, hydrogen. <laughs> 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 Opens up basically temperature again, those elements, uh, molecular molecules are aluminum, and they're a very strong line. It's not, not, not like. So, around 1000K or so? Well, I don't know, I've done calculate it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think your point is now to one of the. the uh, Right. Wouldn't it be nice other than CH4 methane? Yeah. We have CH3D, right? <laughs> <laughs> D is a very the loop. So um, they, but AL AL2 and AL AL has a uh, aluminum. Aluminum used to be mm -hmm. one possible detection. Okay. Aluminum oxide, uh, fluoride. And they want to see outside. I'm not familiar with that at all. So. Mm. Thank you. Okay. I saw some other question. Yeah. You mentioned about the the uh, the substandard object may change the standard type. So this change will repeatable or it's just like a one way like decay or you mean it's getting yeah getting fan fan colder yeah yeah. yeah. Spectral types are defined by temperature, yeah, huh? right? So even what a single object, yes, with age, it becomes, so it will transfer from M mm -hmm. to L to T mm -hmm. and to Y. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's so defined by temperature. So not like a oh, flare. Oh, flare. No, flare will not change the, the overall effective temperature. It will brighten a little bit. And my second question is, does this uh, substantial, uh, uh, like, substandard object including into the stellar population synthesis? Into yeah. stellar population synthesis? Yes, yeah, for the galaxies. Oh, I don't, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. If, if the initial mass function is going like this, mm -hmm. right, they do not outnumber stars. So they will not contribute much to the total mass. Even if this, that will be interesting. Even though they are of low mass, but they have a lot of, there are a lot of, that will be interesting. But at the moment, it seems like I don't know. Any other question? Yeah. So you show the uh, projective distance to the uh, objective distance of uh, histogram the projected distance in different kinds of cells. And uh, you also know the proper motion velocity of those cells. And uh, does it fit to the, uh, because we know the lifetime of uh, the class, each class, uh, the lifetime of the object each class. So does it fit to the lifetime? You know, something I learned, I'm sorry, there, there are a lot of extra here. I tend to slip saying that, well, class zero sources are yeah. They're not. They're just least evolved, right? So I, I have to keep reminding myself. No, it's not that they, they form at the same time and class zero are just now being formed. Not necessarily. They're embedded. That's, that's all we know. So first of all, yes, given the one, or one to two million year old, they can move that far. All right, so the answer is yes. But we don't know whether a, 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 
class zero star, uh, one particular star uh, object is 50,000 years or 30,000 years old. We don't know. Good. Any other final question? And maybe I'm just going to Because you mentioned the Dynamo. Dynamo? Yeah, because you've been the And uh, actually, you're already showing your slides. The thing, the uh, Ethereum structure of the substrate objects, including Jupiter, actually is partially dictionary gas. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's pressure actually um, produce this dictionary uh, ionization. ionization. It's just not temperature. Right, right, right. So actually, they do have dynamo, and they even for Jupiter, they have dynamo. They produce charged particles. Charged particles, mm -hmm. not that ionization. But only in a part. Only in a part. So in order to have a flare, you not you need to have a sufficient high temperature so of surface action in I order to move the magnetic field. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good. So that's uh, so when he will be here until. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, hopefully for another 20 years. <laughs> okay, so later we will have a ceremony. Uh, and uh, we will join, and uh, also if you are interested in chatting with him, you can catch us later. So that's thanks uh, when we talk. Okay.